Through 10 weeks, a 6-3 and three record is a good thing, but not everything. We know that not all records are created equal. So which of these teams are contenders, and which of them are pretenders? Well, of the nine teams with a win total of six, it's time to play in the mix for Bag of Bricks. And let's start with the Los Angeles Rams. We all know Sean McVay is an offensive mind, but make no mistake, these Rams are actually a defensive team. And under first-year defensive coordinator Brandon Staley, that side of the ball is really continuing to show that it's elite. You got Aaron Donald drawing triple and double teams, elevating the pass rushers around him, and Jalen Ramsey locking up number one wideouts, elevating that deep secondary around him. And what they're doing is showing that they're great at making adjustments because in the second half, they've given up a field goal or less in eight of their nine games. And with the 49ers banged up beyond belief, I mean, look, man, that's one less playoff caliber team for them to worry about in an absolutely stacked NFC West division. Now, I am a little bit concerned about that left tackle spot now that Andrew Whitworth is sidelined for the next six to eight weeks with the MCL injury. And Joseph Noteboom is the guy replacing him. He's been inconsistent at the interior O-line spots at times, but tackle seems like a much more natural spot for him. So, yeah, the Rams, they have the lowest scoring offense in the NFC West, but that's a unit that is still ripe with playmakers and thrives in play action so long as they can continue to consistently run the football and so long as McVay doesn't abandon the running game in those dire situations that sometimes he tends to get pass happy. Now yeah, Jared Goff might not be as awesome as his biggest supporters say he is, but he is certainly not as bad as his biggest haters say he is. Look, this guy's a top 13 quarterback in this league and that is good enough to keep this Rams team in the mix to win the NFC West make some noise in the playoffs, and maybe even get back to a Super Bowl if the team can avoid devastating injuries. The Rams are absolutely contenders. Without a doubt, they're in the mix. Now over in Seattle, Russ has played uncharacteristically bad football these past few weeks. Last week against the Rams was not good. His questionable decision-making and penchant for turning the ball over recently has probably taken him out of the MVP race at this point, but I don't think he cares. Winning MVP is not important, but playing like one is because that's the only way the Hawks are going to have a chance. Take Russ off this version of the Seahawks, and through 10 weeks, you're probably looking at a 3-6 and six team at best. Now, I do think they'll be fine on offense moving forward, especially as they get their depth back at running back. But defensively, this team is just historically bad. Like, I'm talking, they can't cover a soul in the secondary. And that doesn't bode well when you're competing against the Cardinals and Rams who have tons of extremely talented pass catchers. The defense can improve, but not by much and not by enough. It's why I'm here to tell you today that the 2020 Seahawks as currently constructed are a bag of bricks. They are more like pretenders than they are contenders. And through 10 weeks of action, it's not the Hawks or Rams or the defending champions holding it down at the top of the NFC West. That spot actually belongs to last year's last place team, the Arizona Cardinals. Now this team is dangerous and it's pretty easy to understand why. Kyler Murray's second year leap, it's landed him in that outer realm of the MVP conversation. And the minute they traded for DeAndre Hopkins, I knew this was a team with, first, uh, with the worst of first potential. I was skeptical about it actually happening especially with how much the offensive line in Arizona struggled to protect Kyler last season. But honestly, credit to Kyler because he took it upon himself to not take as many sacks by getting rid of the football quicker. The guy's definitely a rhythm player, so as for Arizona's status as contenders, it'll really depend on if he can maintain that high level of play. Because over on the other side of the ball, this is a team that as a defensive unit is still clearly missing Chandler Jones' presence. But while their defense is missing Jones at D end, they still have plenty of playmakers that can force turnovers in big moments of games. Buda Baker definitely leading the way and being the key to making that all go in the secondary. Now all things considered, I'm gonna go ahead and actually say that Arizona's in the mix, but just barely because they're keeping teams around too long and they play to the level of competition. So. Again, if not for that Hale Murray to beat Buffalo, the team is 5-4 and four and in sole possession of third place instead of where they are right now in first place. And then they had that 
week eight game against the Seahawks where they just barely eked out that win. So we'll have to see the Thursday night road game against Seattle, who is looking to avoid slipping any further what the Cardinals are going to look like. And then with two games against the Rams yet to be played, the jury is still out on Arizona as the NFC West's best team. So we'll have to see if they can prove themselves as legitimate contenders. But right now, the NFC's top seven is pretty much solidified at this point, and it looks like Arizona is a lock for a wild card spot at least. And with Buffalo losing to the Cardinals in Week 10, it especially put the Miami Dolphins in a fantastic position. The Finns, they're 6-3, and three, winners of five straight because they're putting it all together in what's been a Coach of the Year type of season for Brian Flores. Now, I would like to once again apologize to the Dolphins and their fans for being dead wrong about them in my preseason prediction. While I knew Miami's influx of talent would make them better than last year, I didn't think it would necessarily equate to a total and win jump. I thought that the NFC West would handle Miami, but instead it's been the other way around, man. And while Ryan Fitzpatrick was doing just fine for them, a big reason why the Dolphins are 3-0 and in two of his first three games as a starter is because the team is taking a lot of pressure off their rookie quarterback. With the way the defense and special teams units are coming together and putting it all together, Tua's pretty fortunate that he doesn't have to force anything crazy. All he has to do is just make his collective plays when he's asked to do so. But even though they're playing awesome right now, even though they have impressive wins against good teams, and even though they're just one game back of the AFC East leading Buffalo Bills, I'm still not ready to classify the Dolphins as a legitimate AFC contender in 2020. And just hear me out. Part of it's got to do with Tua's inexperience at the NFL level, but it's more so a reflection of the top-heavy nature of the AFC. So with all due forms of respect, I gotta say that the Miami Dolphins are still a bag of bricks at this point. But hey, they've already proved me wrong this year. Who's to say they can't keep on doing it? And so at 9-0, the Steelers are the class of the AFC, the class of that division. It's clear they're the best team in that division, but behind them are two 6-3 teams in Baltimore and Cleveland. Now let me tell you, one of them is good and the other is not. I think people just need to chill out on this Ravens hate parade, man. I mean, come on. They just lost their first road game of the year in a monsoon. Yeah, Lamar's not playing that great this year, but even with all the injuries piling up at key positions like tight end and the lackluster wide receiver play, the Ravens still have a path toward contention, man. They just gotta stick to who they are. And from a schematic standpoint, they actually have a lot of simple fixes if you think about it. When you have the league's best dual threat QB, why would you ever go into a Wildcat offense on 4th and 1? I mean, that's that's as dumb as it gets. And I'm sure the Ravens will look at that, what they did against the Patriots, throw it out, and never do it again. Now, the Ravens have a great defense and a great running game when they don't abandon the running game. Those two right there, you combine them together, that's a recipe to win games in the postseason. And yeah, your O-line isn't as strong as it was last year, but it's still definitely good enough to get the job done. And just because defensive coordinators are coming up with better schemes doesn't mean that people have quote-unquote figured out Lamar Jackson. It really just comes down to executing, playing a clean, mis mistake-free game of football, and they gotta just start scripting their drives better so they can stick to what they do best and jump ahead early because their offense is not built to play from behind and erase big leads. I mean, a playoff matchup with Kansas City would probably be a nightmare because they got that high-octane offense. That's not ideal, but Baltimore's got plenty of familiarity with Pittsburgh, and I think they can hold their own against a lot of these other top AFC teams. So to me, the Ravens at 6-3, and three, definitely still in the mix. Now 6-3, and three, it's a good place to be, but it's not good enough to feel comfortable, especially not in the AFC North, because just like the Ravens, the Browns are right there at 6-3. and three. Now don't get me wrong, I'm happy for Browns fans, but can we slow down on anointing this team? Cleveland's 6-3 is fraudulent compared to Baltimore's 6-3. And cool, you beat Washington, Dallas, and Houston. Congrats on beating the Bengals twice, man. I mean, you're supposed to do that. But as for their two other division rivals, well, remind me again, don't the Browns have two losses of 31-plus points against the Steelers and Ravens? And then, isn't your only win against a team with a winning record against the Colts? Now, I know you can't control who you play, and you can only control how you play, but that's something you got to talk about when you talk about these Browns. Now, the next two games, they should be favored against the Eagles and Jags, but we'll really find out what they're made of in the two weeks after, because in weeks 13 and 14, they'll get Tennessee on the road and Baltimore at home. 
That's back-to-back tough games. And if the Browns can go 3-1 and one in that four-game stretch, I'll be ready to call them contenders. Because by that point, they'll be cruising into two manageable road games against the Giants and Jets with a Week 17 matchup against the Steelers team that could be resting key starters if they've already locked up the uh, AFC North and the one seed. Now, the Browns are in third place right now because, you know, they got a great running game and with Chubb and Hunt. Other than that, there's not really much to write home about. I think they're a bag of bricks. I think they'll stay in that third spot in the AFC North, and that's not a bad thing. Like, they're they're doing better. But not the same old Browns, but this is not a playoff team if you ask me, and they're not going to do anything. If they do get to the playoffs, I don't think they're going to do anything with it. Now, one of the more interesting teams at 6-3 and three is this Indianapolis Colts team. Their defense, man, has just been absolutely lights out. Fewest yards allowed per game. Second fewest passing yards. Third fewest rushing yards. And with under 20 points allowed per game, they've got the fourth best scoring defense. And then on the other side of the ball, Frank Reich finally getting creative with how he uses rookie wideout Michael Pittman, who seems poised to really emerge in a much-needed playmaking role to help Phillip Rivers. I was impressed with the all-around performance I saw out of Indy against the Titans on Thursday night in Week 10. But I'm still not sold on the team as AFC contenders because four of their six wins have come against teams with losing records, and they had the second easiest schedule through Week 10. Now, they'll have their hands full the rest of the way in the regular season as they draw tougher matchups against the Packers, Titans, Raiders, and Steelers. So for the sake of this segment, I'm going to go ahead and say that with that schedule ahead of time, the Colts are still a bag of bricks, but maybe they can prove me wrong. Elsewhere in the AFC South, a fast 5-0 start in Tennessee is now turned into 6-3 after a few disappointing losses. You got an underperforming secondary, putting the Titans in the bottom five in passing yards allowed, and they're not getting any help on special teams. You got Goskowski missing kicks left and right, killing this team most recently with that missed game-tying field goal at home and a loss to the Steelers that I thought they should have won that game. However, this is still a very well-coached football team under Mike Vrabel that still runs the football with the best of them, and those two things combined with Tannehill's comfortability making big throws when he needs to tells me the Titans are going to be fine. And while the Titans currently sit in second place behind the Colts, I think they're the better team top to bottom than Indy. But even if they don't win the division, the Titans still have the formula to secure a wildcard spot and put together a solid playoff run. So with all that said, I'm actually going to go out in there and say that Even though they're technically out of the playoff picture right now, there's still a lot of time left. And I'm still very comfortable saying that the Titans are still in the mix to represent the AFC South, represent possibly the AFC in the Super Bowl, because they've got the formula to win those cold-weather January football games. But how about those Raiders, man? They got that recipe, too. They've won three of their past four games after a 2-2 two and two start to take possession of what would be the fifth seed right now if the playoffs were to start today. And don't tell me the Raiders don't have anything to show for themselves either because look at their resume, man. They got some impressive wins. Three teams with six or more wins. They've beat them all. They got Kansas City, New Orleans, and Cleveland. All three of those teams, they beat them. I mean, Derek Carr quietly having a great year despite the fact that the Silver and Black have been depleted at the offensive line throughout the 2020 season. But if that's been a problem, I mean, it sure hasn't seemed like much of one at all because nobody on that team has complained about it at all. I mean, they beat New Orleans with that depleted O-line, and if you look at their current three-game winning streak that they're on, they were without three starting linemen in all three of those games. That didn't stop them from continuing to run the football really well. And 190.4 yards per game in that three-game stretch, going over 200 in two of those games... This is a good team, man. 6-3. and three. I'm really impressed with the Raiders this season. I picked them to earn a 7th seed in a wild card just barely, but there's a lot of season left. It's far from a lock. They're not going to win the division, but things look promising for them, and they're giving me a lot of reason to remain confident in that pick for them to earn a wild card spot. They've done really well with what's been the 6th toughest schedule so far based on opponent win percentage. Now they just have to continue to keep doing that because they got Miami and Indy on the way. But to me, they're still in the mix because of how they match up against the AFC's elite teams. 
While they've struggled on defense, I think they can hold their own versus Pittsburgh's weak rushing attack and versus Baltimore's weak wide receiver core. And then they've played Kansas City for years. They know what they're all about. You still got to stop them, but they got familiarity with them. So that leaves you with the Bills, who are probably their toughest matchup. I'm not going to advise anybody to put their life savings on the Raiders to win a bunch of playoff games, but even though it's just one year in that brand new city, in that brand new stadium, I would not be shocked at all if they had some sort of magical run. Not one bit. But for all these six and three teams, we'll just have to wait and see how everything plays out. And that's the beauty of this football game that we all love.